Hello, welcome to the first lecture on the online course on analysis and modeling of welding. My name is Gandham Panikumar. I am a faculty member of the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering, IIT Madras. In this first lecture, we are going to introduce the different welding processes and then look at how the heat input and other specific aspects of the process will be differing across the different welding processes. Let us first look at under what overview uh, does uh, the joining and welding processes come under. We have basically a large number of manufacturing processes which can be categorized broadly as casting processes which are the primary manufacturing processes such as ingot casting, shape casting, powder metallurgy, etc. And then forming processes where we uh, change the shape by using processes such as uh, forging, extrusion, drip drawing, sheet metal forming, etc. And then we have machining processes which are somewhat like material removal processes which include turning, boring, drilling, milling, grinding, etc. Advanced processes such as abrasive jet cutting and water jet cutting, etc. also fall under the machining processes. And it is in this broad category that joining processes also come and they can be called as fabrication processes because they are used to fabricate a large part from several small parts. So, the large number of joining processes exist and they can be categorized broadly again uh, into the following categories. Uh, mechanical fastening is a fabrication process where the different parts are joined together uh, mechanically uh, without a metallurgical bond between the two parts that are being joined. We also have adhesive joining where dissimilar parts can be joined uh, using uh, epoxy and various polymeric materials. Uh, brazing and soldering are joining processes that are of importance to materials where the melting points are very different and it is the uh, filler which will join these two uh, mating parts rather than melting of the two mating parts. The difference between brazing and soldering is basically a definition of temperature 450 degrees centigrade is arbitrarily chosen as a cutoff. So, a process that works below 450 degrees centigrade can be called as soldering, the process that works above can be called as brazing. So, welding comes under this broad set of uh, processes. Okay. So, welding is one of the fusion processes that come under this broad category. And the welding processes again can be categorized by uh, different uh, source of uh, joining. Uh, the first uh, set is by arc welding where there is a an electric arc that is used to join the two materials. I have given the acronyms here as per the AWS American Welding Society specification. So, there are several arc welding techniques such as uh, shielded metal arc welding which is also called as stick welding or manual metal arc welding. And then GMAW gas metal arc welding which is also referred to as MIG welding metal inert gas welding which is an automated process. GTAW which is also referred to as stick welding gas tungsten arc welding and SAW which is a submerged arc welding, FCAW flux code arc welding and then PAW plasma arc welding. So, there are so many different varieties that are possible using electric arc as a heat source. We have also uh, processes that use resistance, uh, electrical resistance to join the materials. So, we have a spot welding, seam welding, projection welding, etc. Uh, the welding uh, does not require actually the materials to be completely molten. So, solid state uh, welding also is possible. So, we have processes such as ultrasonic welding, friction welding, explosive welding, etc., where the fusion uh, is not explicitly caused. And then we also have a specialized processes where the uh, melting is initiated by using a beam of high energy. So, we have LBW that is laser beam welding and EBW that is electron beam welding as processes that use a uh, high energy beam to lead to the welding process. And these welding uh, geometries uh, can then be looked at by looking at the type of joints. So, here are five uh, joints that are usually referred to. This is essentially to make the terminology familiar to you as we use these names later on. So, what is normally referred to as a butt joint is essentially when the two mating parts are juxtaposed be, uh, beside each other and then the joint is made. Lap joint is where the two mating parts are kept on top of each other and then the joint is made. A T joint is where the mating parts are 
uh, configured to look like a T and then a corner joint where they are kept at an angle to each other and then at the edge they are then joined. Edge joint is basically again a joint where the two mating parts are initially kept in the butt geometry, but then are folded up so that they can be joined along the edge rather than along the plane. So, we will also make ourselves familiar with uh, some more uh, joints uh, which uh, can be uh, understood by looking at the extent of the weld uh, that is penetrated. So, there are what are called as uh, uh, bead or surface welds where a plate is uh, welded by making the welding torch move along the surface. And these are generally used to join uh, materials that are uh, of low thickness and there is not much of uh, preparation that is required to join materials in this fashion. Uh, for thicker materials uh, however, we will need what is called as a groove weld uh, and uh, we will talk about that in detail briefly. A fillet weld is where we have them uh, in the lap geometry and at the junction between the two plates we have the joint being made using a filler. Plug weld is something like a spot weld where locally the uh, melt zone is made to join the two materials. Little bit detail about these, a bead or a surface weld uh, is uh, used very often for butt welds and the advantage of uh, this geometry is that there is no edge preparation that is required and this is used for thin sheets of metal and this is also used for example to build up surfaces. So, if you want to repair a part then you can remove uh, some material by gouging or any metal removal process and then the material can be built up at the same location again by making a bead on top of the material. We also can actually deposit uh, different materials on top of uh, objects that require a different property on the surface by using what is called as a weld overlay. So, weld overlay is basically a process that is very similar to welding. However, the jo joining is not the objective of the process, but uh, uh, depositing a different material usually a corrosion resistant material or an abrasion resistant material uh, is deposited and these are generally done in a job entry that is called as surface weld. Groove welds are uh, ones that are used for uh, large thickness joints. So, these are also uh, usually made in uh, butt geometry and uh, the uh, large thickness also implies that uh, we will have the weld penetrating uh, to the entire thickness and that would require a very detailed edge preparation and very often uh, the welding techniques may not be able to join the entire thickness in one go. So, we may have to resort to what is called as a multi pass welding. So, how detailed can the uh, joint preparation or edge preparation be in a groove weld is uh, clear from uh, this set of uh, groove preparations. The image has been taken from Wikipedia, but these joints are uh, names are used in the literature quite commonly. So, we have what are called uh, square, closed square, single bevel, single j, double bevel, double j, single v, single u, double v, w etcetera. So, we one can actually make a very detailed edge preparation so that we can achieve a large thickness weld by making beads uh, one after other and the number of beads depend upon the uh, thickness that we have to join. So, there are situations for example, in nuclear industry where we may have to join uh, uh, several tens of centimeters of uh, uh, thickness uh, plates and uh, these could be joined for example, in uh, several dozens or even hundreds of uh, beads that are uh, done one top of other. Fillet welds are uh, what are used to join materials when they are kept in a lab geometry and uh, T, lap and corner all three can be joined in this uh, mode of uh, fillet welds. The advantage of uh, this particular way of joining is that there is no edge preparation. However, there is a requirement that you need to have a filler. Plug welds are basically uh, replacements for uh, fastening process, uh, fastening process being only a mechanical joint. If we want to make that fastening uh, to be permanent in nature, then we would normally resort to what we call as a plug weld. So, holes are drilled on the sheets that are on the so top surface and then a weld bead is uh, made on the top, uh, so that then the um, hole is covered by the deposited material. Uh, these also are uh, used when there is no uh, design possibility to have an excess deposit and the plug welds can be also called as spot welds. 
the welding itself can be done in different directions and there are names that are commonly used in uh, welding literature. So, we must familiarize ourselves with these uh, names also and uh, here I have given you a schematic that shows the five different welding positions in which welding is done. Uh, some welding positions are such that certain welding processes cannot be used. I have uh, shown on the left hand side a vector showing the gravity direction downwards which means that uh, in this cube the gravity is ac ac acting uh, in the downward direction. So, the five directions uh, along which the torch can move are shown here. We have the uh, most common way of uh, joining uh, which is called as a flat geometry. Uh, in a flat position essentially the welding torch is kept uh, almost vertically up and it is moved horizontally on a plane and uh, this uh, geometry is most common. A horizontal geometry is where we have the torch moving horizontally and the uh, welding torch is held uh, not in the direction of gravity, but at 90 degrees to it. Vertically up and vertically down will also require that the welding torch is held 90 degrees to the gravity direction, but it is moved vertically up or down as opposed to horizontal direction. Overhead welding is uh, a very different uh, geometry, it is where the uh, uh, torch is held uh, exactly anti parallel to the gravity direction and then it is moved along the horizontal direction. So, which means that uh, the arc is uh, going in the direction opposite to the gravity. So, the welding processes which we have uh, looked at till now uh, fall under the broad category what is called as a fusion welding and these fusion welding uh, processes are also then uh, classified in different different uh, terminologies and we will make ourselves familiar with the terminology here. Uh, we will uh, be able to classify them as uh, consumable and non-consumable electrode uh, to basically look at uh, whether the uh, electrode is uh, used as a filler or not. So, we have uh, processes such as uh, TIG welding where it will be a non-consumable electrode welding and then a process such as MIG welding would be a consumable electrode welding. The welding can also be done without any filler at all, in which case it is called as an autogenous welding. And if it is used with a filler, you can say that it is a welding with filler. And this filler uh, may match the material properties uh, of the base metal, in which case you can call it as a homogeneous uh, welding. And in case the material that is used for the filler is different from the base material, uh, so that the welding process is uh, successfully completed without any weld cracking etcetera, then you would call that as a heterogeneous uh, welding process. So, homogeneous and heterogeneous imply that there is a filler that is used which is either same or different from the base material and that is also one more way of classifying the fusion welding processes. Fusion welding also means that the material that is being joined is going to be molten and as you all know most of the metallic materials when they are in the liquid state are highly reactive and uh, that would require that we have a protection for the liquid metal, so that it does not form oxides. If oxides are formed, they will enter the base metal during the solidification of the weld pool and then cause uh, defects and uh, cracks later on. So, it is important to protect the liquid metal uh, during welding and this can be done by either a flux or an inert gas. So, you could also classify fusion welding processes as uh, flux protected uh, welding process and inert gas protected welding process. Uh, fusion welding uh, may not be successful for a, a high thickness uh, joint in uh, one pass. So, you would also like to perhaps uh, classify the fusion welding processes as single pass and multi pass. Multi pass actually would open up uh, uh, more uh, complications uh, to understand the thermal process, because we would have multiple single passes that are laid on top of each other and the residual heat would start playing a role with the welding efficiency that would be uh, implied for the further passes. Some more terminology for us to make ourselves familiar. So, we would be referring to what is called as a traverse rate. So, what we mean by traverse rate is basically the velocity with which the welding torch or welding source is moved and it would be usually uh, with the units the same as velocity meters per second, but the unit that is used in welding community will be in millimeters per second, it will be usually uh, hundreds of millimeters per second. And uh, heat input is a specific term that is used, uh, it should not be confused with the English meaning uh, uh, which conveys that amount of heat that is given, but it is actually a ratio of the 
power that is being given by the welding source to the base material to the velocity at which the welding torch is moving. So, the power has a units of joules per second and velocity has units of meters per second. So, you would have heat input having the units of joules per unit length of the weld that is taking place. Uh, this also means that a welding process uh, which has a high speed capability would naturally be of a low heat input and this may not be obvious from the word heat input when we apply uh, to processes such as electron beam which are known to be low heat input processes. Rate of heat input or heat intensity is also one term that we will use. It is basically to show at what rate the heat will be arriving from the heat source to the base material and it would be normally referred to in the units of uh, power per unit area watt per meter square. And the area over which the rate of heat input is being applied should also be normally known so that we can integrate this particular quantity to know how much of heat has been deposited completely on the base metal over the duration when the welding is taking place. And how this heat is then distributed spatially on the surface of the uh, base metal is also important and that is what we refer to as heat intensity distribution. Heat in intensity distribution is often such that it is a maximum value at the center of the welding torch and it goes down as you go away from the welding torch. However, this will not be the only variation of heat intensity distribution. You can also have other variations that are possible as in for example, laser welding where a very detailed uh, set of lenses uh, could give you any uh, distribution that you would wish. We will come to that uh, shortly in a next lecture. So, these are the quantities that we will be referring to uh, again and again uh, during the course of this talk. So, the technical meaning of these terms and the rough values of uh, these quantities for a given welding process uh, should uh, come to us uh, naturally as we go along this course. So, there are several uh, welding processes that we are going to look at uh, for an overview in this first lecture and I have listed some of them. This is not a comprehensive list of all the processes uh, that are important in the industry, uh, but it would give you a fairly large uh, set of processes that would cover what would, what would be happening in the industry. So, these are the processes we are going to look at uh, shielded metal arc welding, uh, gas metal arc welding, uh, tungsten uh, arc welding, plasma arc welding, uh, submerged arc welding, electron beam welding and laser beam welding. So, before we proceed further with an overview of all these uh, welding processes, it is important for us to look at how the uh, electric arc is generated and uh, how it is sustained and then how that is playing a role as a heat source. So, so here is the detail, we have uh, the geometry on the right hand side in the schematic showing you that there is an electrode and uh, what is coming out uh, sharply below is the electrode which is uh, usually uh, tungsten in the case of uh, non-consumable uh, uh, electrode and it is the same material as the filler that is used as a wire and uh, work piece is shown at the bottom. Now, uh, it is the work piece that has to be joined uh, during the welding process and I am showing you between the electrode and work piece uh, what appears to be a electric arc. So, there must be a polarity that must be applied for the electrode and work piece and usually work piece will be given a connection to the earthing and electrode will be then given a voltage either positive or negative as the polarity would require. And uh, the both electrode and the workpiece have to be conductors of electricity, so that upon application of voltage and a small gap that separates between the two, an electric arc can be struck. And uh, this arc uh, should then be uh, ionizing the uh, gas that is present in between the electrode and the workpiece, which usually will be uh, argon or uh, helium as you may choose and uh, the ionized gas would then start uh, moving the energy from the electrode onto the work piece. So, it is important that the arc is stabilized so that the welding process can continue uh, during the entire fabrication requirement and sustained energy uh, discharge uh, from the electrode onto the work piece is uh, possible uh, when we look at uh, what constitutes the uh, environment that surrounds the arc and uh, we will look at that shortly. So, what kind of gases can be used to make the arc in a arc welding? So, here I am uh, just showing you some uh, requirements for the gas uh, 
uh, the gas generally uh, for a given metal that you want to join could be either inert or active. And uh, usually we would choose the gas which is inert because we do not want it to react with the base material and form compounds that are not desirable. However, there are situations where an active gas may also be deployed. And the most important role of the gas uh, is to shield the um, liquid metal uh, from getting affected by the environment around and to uh, give the stability of the arc. And the kind of gases that are generally uh, available in engineering uh, environment are listed here carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, argon and helium. And I have listed the uh, parameter called as ionization potential on the right hand side in electron volts. So, what it implies is that this is the kind of energy that is required to ionize the gas and that gives you a hint about how much of voltage is required to strike an arc and sustain it. And you could see that argon and helium at the bottom are given in bold because they are the ones that are commonly used in welding process. As you can see that argon has a lower ionization potential and it is also having a slightly higher density which means that the shroud, gas shroud will stay put near the arc without getting diffused away very fast which makes argon as the gas of choice for use in welding processes. So, there are some characteristics of the arc that we need to be familiar with, uh, so that we can understand why the uh, voltage and uh, current conditions that are chosen for welding are like that. So, we are seeing in this uh, uh, plot a red curve that is going uh, from top to bottom and this curve is also called as the drooping characteristic of the power source. Essentially, there is a voltage uh, roughly between 60 and 80 volts that would be called as the op open circuit voltage that is available for the welding source. And uh, uh, the um, voltage current uh, characteristic is such that it is drooping down that is going down uh, as the current is increased. And how the arc will behave is uh, given in the uh, roughly U shaped or a tick shaped curve uh, that is shown in green color. On the left hand side that is at low voltage and low current corner. Uh, the arc is not stable and therefore, those parameters should not be used for welding. So, in the linear portion of this curve, we can start exploring uh, the parameters for the welding purpose and as you can see that for the same current, you would need a higher voltage to sustain arc over a longer length. It also means that during the welding process, if the arc length is varying uh, because of any reason such as a manual operation or because of surface undulations on the sample surface, it also means that the voltage at which we have to do the uh, welding also will vary. And the drooping characteristic of the power source as well as the arc characteristic intersect at points. So, those are the combinations which are basically the appropriate uh, voltage and current uh, choices so that the welding can take place. And I have highlighted the voltage ranges in blue background showing is a normal operating range which turns out to be between 15 and 30 volts for most of the uh, arc welding uh, sources. And the current values that would uh, come out would be then between 100 and 300 amps. So, the electrode can then be given a different polarity uh, for the purpose of uh, welding and uh, we normally have uh, a terminology that would also describe this. We call what is called the direct current straight polarity DCSP when the electrode is negatively charged and this is used whenever deeper penetration is required. DCSP is also called as DCEN that is electrode negative. There is a second type of polarity that is referred to as direct current reverse polarity DCEP electrode positive and you also can use alternating current that is change the polarity from positive to negative at a particular frequency. So, the electrode polarities are given in three different manners. To understand how these polarities are to be chosen, we will go to a schematic on what happens when we change the polarities. So, then the electrode negative polarity what happens is that because electrode is negative, the negatively charged electrons are going away from the electrode into the workpiece and the electrons are uh, accelerated uh, very high uh, in the arc and they are then stopped by the workpiece 
which uh, uh, converts the kinetic energy of the electrons into heat that will be generated in the work piece, which is basically the major source of energy release because of the arc on the surface of the work piece. And the positively charged ions, which basically are, bas are argon ions, uh, when argon is the gas that is causing the arc, uh, these argon ions are then moving in the opposite direction going towards the electrode in the case of DC En. And, uh, uh, you can see that there is a uh, change in the direction when we go to the electrode positive geometry and what would happen in that situation is now analogous. What happens when the electrode is positive is that the electrons which are uh, having high amount of kinetic energy are then getting absorbed in the electrode, which means that the electrode is uh, going to have more energy generated in its uh, surface and it may cause the electrode to heat up fast and may even melt, which means that this is not recommended uh, polarity when you have a non-consumable uh, electrode welding process. Uh, however, uh, for MIG welding where the electrode is to be also molten and deposited, then it would be a recommended polarity. And uh, there is a another reason why we would choose the electrode positive polarity and that is evident from the direction in which the argon ions are going to travel. So, as you can see the positively charged ions, they are rushing towards the work piece because the electrode is positively charged and the work piece is at neutral. And what this uh, implies is that if the work piece is going to be having a surface layer uh, which has a little bit of uh, surface oxide, then the uh, large argon ions that are going to bombard the uh, surface of the work piece can break the uh, oxide layer on the surface and expose the metallic surface for a smooth joining uh, process. So, this also implies that if you are going to join um, aluminum or stainless steel where the surface generally has an oxide layer, thin oxide layer, then DCEP polarity is suitable. However, we normally have uh, both of these alternating for these kind of materials. So, we have uh, AC where the positively charged argon ions as well as the electrons which are negatively charged are moving alternatively towards the electrode and towards the work piece, which means that you would have the advantage of both the surface cleaning namely the uh, dissociation of the surface oxide as well as uh, uh, enhanced uh, energy release on the surface of the work piece by the electrons that are coming with high kinetic energy and getting stopped. So, often we have a choice of these three polarities and we make a judicious uh, pick of the combination that is required for the um, particular material that is being joined. These uh, values namely the voltage and current uh, need not be kept constant during the uh, welding process. Uh, as you can see in the AC uh, polarity, uh, the voltage has to be going from positive to negative at a particular frequency and uh, you could then see that as usually a sine wave. Uh, you could also have a bias to that particular sine wave, so that it can be made as an unbalanced sine wave. And this also means that the electrode will be having different amount of time spent in the straight polarity and reverse polarity regimes. And this is tunable either going upwards or downwards, so that whichever polarity you desire most can be increased in the amount of duration, so that the unbalanced sine wave can be made to work for the particular combination that you are interested. We also can have a square wave that is the voltage can be kept constant at a particular value and then be changed sharply and suddenly to another value and uh, these variations can then be repeated at a particular frequency. So, you could also have not only sine waves, but also square waves. Such temporal profiles of voltage would also imply that the um, current also will have similar uh, temporal profiles. You may have currents that are changed uh, from a high value to a low value uh, at a particular frequency uh, when you employ for example, a square wave. How these uh, temporal profiles are useful in designing low heat input uh, welding processes will be evident later on when we discuss further. So, we must understand that not only the polarity can be changed but their temporal variations can also be changed, which means that the advances that are taking place in the welding source equipment uh, can then uh, be used to design new welding processes by looking at all these combinations electronically and automatically configured. 
So, before we end the first part of this module, uh, let me just also just summarize the different uh, characteristics of an arc welding process. So, we normally need to note down what is the voltage, uh, current and the efficiency of the heat transfer to the weld piece that will be taking place. And we also need to know what kind of a waveform was used, was it a flat or a square wave or a sine wave or an unbalanced sine wave etcetera. And in that case then what would be the frequency of that waveform etcetera. And we also need to know whether there are any pulsing effects in the current. Uh, in case of a pulsing effect, what was the peak value, what was the base value, at what frequency is this uh, switchover being uh, made and what is the duration of both the peak and pulse values. And the overall frequency of this process will then uh, determine the characteristics of the arc welding process. And at what rate is this arc moving along the surface of the material that is being joined is also important. So, we need to know down what would be the traverse rate for this welding process. And the wel welding torch may not move in a linear path and this has also uh, implications. So, we may have what is called as a magnetic arc oscillation that may be placed in the welding setup. And uh, in that case then what would happen is that the arc is not going in a linear manner, it is going along a sine path. And uh, what would be the frequency of such a path? what would be the amplitude as of a such a path is also important uh, in understanding how the welding process is going to take place. So, as you can see that uh, during the arc welding process, the number of parameters that can be changed and controlled are large and all of these are very important and how each of these will play a role in the thermal processes that take place during fusion welding using an arc welding process will then be discussed as part of this course. Yeah, so, we will take a short break and then we will come back to the second part of the talk.